Chatbots have become an essential and strategic tool in talent acquisition, recruiting, and candidate experience. Hi, this is Peter Clayton, host of the Total Picture Podcast, and joining me today is Jonathan Duarte, award-winning expert chatbot architect and founder of Go Hire. Jonathan has extensive industry expertise in human resource technology, customer service, SaaS, recruiting software automation, messaging, and enterprise artificial intelligence chatbots and virtual assistants. I've known Jonathan for many years and recently reconnected with him at an HR Tech Alliance virtual event. If you're involved in HR and TA technology, it's really worth becoming part of the HR Tech Alliance community. And I'll put a link to their website in the show notes. GoHire's text messaging chatbot has increased candidate engagements by over 900% and candidate application rates by 500%. Hi, Jonathan. Welcome to the Total Picture Podcast. Yeah, you too, Peter. Love it. I'm glad to hear uh, all is well on the, on the Peter Clayton Show. I'm sure by now everyone has some experience using a chatbot, some good and some bad. What differentiates Go Hire solutions, especially as they relate to talent acquisition and candidate experience? Yeah, I think the, the biggest one is we actually don't even use the word chatbot or conversational AI with most of our clients because the clients that we're uh, solving problems for are looking for hourly um, employees. So we're mostly selling to HR and, um, and recruiters and directors of recruiters. For companies trying to hire 100 to you know 5,000 employees, so we're not going to the enterprise teams who have IT teams and you know looking for you know real enterprise solutions. I like to say, in say using an example like Home Depot, where you have HR managers on a location by location, or Starbucks, you might have a regional manager. Uh, they are in many cases responsible for ultimately responsible for hiring. It's done at a local basis. And so those are the teams that we focus on is the individual uh, recruiters or regional managers. Mm -hmm. And so they can purchase something um, really quickly, but they, we don't talk about technology. We talk about how we solve their problem, which is how do we help them acquire candidates? How do we help them engage candidates? And the fact that, yes, it's a chatbot behind the scenes, they just never know that or they don't care about the term because um, they're non-technical people. So we just talk about it's an apply by tech solution. Got it. So how has the pandemic and the current aftermath changed your chatbot algorithms or has it? It hasn't changed the algorithm so much, but it has created a macroeconomic um, success for the business. Because, you know, two things are happening is that, you know, with the great resignation, there's lots of people um, moving around. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, um, and we've, you know, seen this, you know, in after every recession anyways, um, I wouldn't call it necessarily a recession, but a workforce, you know, um, a change is that. Uh, companies need to do more with less, and that in includes recruiting. Uh, and uh, we know that you know HR tech usually is years behind technologically because of the tech stack um, uh, is more complicated. Uh, but in our system, it's agnostic to whatever you know applicant tracking system you're using. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it makes companies uh, and the recruiting teams more efficient. We'll talk about stats on that, but what happens is in many cases, recruiters aren't able to reach out to candidates quick enough or respond back to them. And candidates want immediate um, results. Uh, and I think I, I've seen some stats out of even, you know, a lot of analysts reports now that if you, if you don't respond back within days, candidates are gone when we talk to recruiters all day long and that's the case. So it's, really about trying to respond back to candidates quickly. And the only way we've been able to do that in the past is throw bodies at it. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't do that anymore because of the cost of labor is going up um, and we need the speed. So HR only has one, one option and that is to automate and find solutions. And the other thing I think is interesting and most people haven't um, realized this is that in a lot of manufacturing and in logistics companies, 
uh, and even in restaurants, um, but any any place we're hiring hourly folks, this is now a business imperative. So operations teams are getting involved in recruiting um, because it's now coming to the you know to the business owner that they're losing money. Like restaurants can't stay open longer days. I was in Hawaii and and the Starbucks was closed after like noon and it would normally be open till five. Um, so we're seeing that in all areas of work um, is they can't staff the shifts appropriately. So it's an operational problem that's causing revenue problems. Wow, Jonathan, in your conversations with recruiters and TA leaders, let's take this a little bit further. Besides what you just described, what are the most significant current pain points? Yeah, it's um, we really talk about two which is the acquisition of candidates and then the engagement. So the acquisition of candidates is, you know, uh, most everyone's using Indeed at this point. And Mm -hmm. of course, everyone's competing against each other on Indeed. But once you, if in some cases, you have to get that candidate into your applicant tracking system. So that would be whatever you define as, uh, you know, acquiring, getting their contact information at the absolute minimum. And then secondarily, uh, the engagement piece. And that's that part of, once a candidate does give you their contact information, what's the process and timeline of responding back and getting that candidate to the next step? And so uh, acquisition, uh, one, of the, one of the things I, I think is actually funny, you'll get, you'll get this too, and I think the, your audience will too, is uh, the, the tools that most everyone uses are called applicant tracking systems. Now, right. they're applicant tracking systems. They're not candidate engagement systems so yeah. uh you know and 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 it's they they started in 2001 you know was the birth of the ats market because of the ofcc definition of a candidate needed to be tracked they weren't about hey how can we get more candidates qualified and and into uh, some sort of funnel faster right so um now knowing that that's the case um There is also a stat from, well, many stats from AppCast who have for years been tracking the number of candidates who complete an application. And their stats now say less than 5% of mobile candidates who visit a career site, say from Indeed, um, would complete an application. Only 5%. Wow. Yeah. So, So that means from if we use the kind of sales and marketing kind of lingo is uh, you're buying a hundred leads and only, uh, only five of them convert. Now, if a uh, company, a, a director of TA said, okay, we need to fix this. So this is like what we call barrier to entry um, uh, or a friction point. If they can change that number from 5% to 10%, it would almost look like they doubled their recruitment budget overnight because they fixed that number. And you don't have to spend twice the amount of money to fix that number. You just have to figure out how to fix that number. And in many cases, you know, where apply by text helps out is it makes it easy for candidates to engage Uh rather than filling out a long form on a website. And we've seen companies double in that number all day long. Well, how does that compare to using chatbots? Several years ago, I interviewed our friend Marin Hogan, founder of Red Branch Media. I'll put a link to that video in the show notes. And according to her research, millennials prefer engaging with a chatbot in the early stages of a job search. Does that jibe with your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And it's for a couple of different reasons. Number one, everyone wants to figure out stuff and learn more by themselves. They don't want to have to talk to somebody, you know, even if it's customer support, Um, you don't want to have to do that because, you know, it's wait time. You may not be able to get the specific information you have to give, you know, and, you know, we've all been through the uh, enter your credit card 15 times in your 16 digits. It's like, you you know, I, I just want the info. Right. So, um, that's where a chat and there's a couple of different chatbots. I think that's important to use and, and uh, to understand is so there's different channels. So there's text where we make it really, really simple. Um, it's not a 
you know, six month install uh, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to, you know, get this technology set up. It's literally, oh, I mean, literally overnight where a wow. client comes and says, hey, um, we want to do this. Here's our five questions. Um, and so we built it. So we can't do it instantaneously with customized questions yet. Uh, but uh, we, we are, we're getting pretty close. But so that type of texting one where you're just trying to get someone to answer questions back and forth, um, that we you will know, we'll call it a, you know, this a typical apply by apply by text. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's a chatbot. But the other ones that we've seen um, also are web based. So you've seen on a career site you can have a chatbot, and that chatbot can uh, do a, you know lots of things. Uh, one of which, and we have staffing clients that you know they're going to have people who need. Uh, clients, you know, uh, employers looking to hire, but they also need candidates to fill out an application and then schedule time with a recruiter. So a a web chatbot can do both of those features, can can be used for sales candidates or sales clients, and then can also be used for candidates. Um, And you can also have like the frequently asked questions like, what's the culture like, um, and then point to other content on the website. So it, they're morphing into a lot of different ways to support customers uh, or candidates at this point, uh, but it really depends on the, on the type of client and uh, process they're trying to solve for. Say like a Marriott, um, if you're putting a website up, you know, if, you've, if you're a large brand, there's a very good chance that you want a career site chatbot that can um, reference all those YouTube videos, all that employee engagement content that you've built over the years. And you may have hundreds of pages on your career site that never gets attention. That's where a a career site chatbot would be helpful because typically the difference between a chatbot experience and a web experience is a web experience goes through if you think about this you you go to a career site and there's like 20 links on the page um, but you know we just don't really know how people get to where but with a chatbot the candidate just asks a question and we send them to the right place so and we can give get them you know point them to the right place um, and, and you know make those navigation tools a lot easier to use uh, so we can get them to that content. So if they want to understand what the, say, the the culture is, um, you probably have a culture video that may be five levels deep on a web page, um, but we can get it to them within two clicks rather than, you know, through five pages. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more, specifically the integration process. Let's say I have a company with three or 400 employees and I want to start deploying your chatbots on my career site. What's involved in that? How long does it take? And what's the training process with the recruiters within my company? Yeah. So again, we'll use the example of like this, like a frequently asked one uh, for candidates. So a uh, frequently asked questions chatbot, generally uh, the process is uh, we ask the client, what, what, what questions do you know you want the candidates to answer? Now we already know the majority of those questions, but they may have some other things that they want to know. Um, so it's really a consultative process to start. Uh, then once we want, know what those questions are, um, I won't bore everyone with the technology on the back end, but we have to be able to understand how someone would ask that question. And then the chatbot can respond back with an answer. So that's what we call the natural language processing piece. Um, we handle that on the back end. So it's really about understanding what, what data is available on, say, the career site, or um, do they just want to answer questions and then send people to different pages? Uh, so it's what's the question and what's the response uh, that the client wants? So that may take, you know, it could be really quick. It could be an iterative process. Um, and it could be changed over time. So that's the, like the career site. Uh, chatbot side, um, it really, it's entirely built on uh, how big the customer is, 
how many, how much info they want. Um, so it's a time materials process and then a maintenance cost, you know, to, to build and maintain it. And those types of chatbots, I'd say for most companies are probably, you know, there are tens of thousands to six figures. Mm -hmm. um, smaller businesses, um, number one, they probably don't need that. Um, all they're really trying to, trying to do is figure out their acquisition and engagement um, rather than trying to sell corporate culture and things like that. You know, and it depends on what kind of workforce, you know, a technology company, they're trying to sell the brand mm -hmm. uh, and the position um, an hourly part-time, if they're, you know, manufacturing they're it's a, it's a transaction, not so much selling the brand. That brings up a question I had, what levels of job postings offer the best chatbot engagements, you know, entry level, mid-level, who is the most likely to respond to a chatbot? Yeah, in our market, we're focused mostly in the hourly part-time uh, employee, which is 40% of the U.S. Uh, workforce. Um, and the reason for that is uh, the technology is uh, when you need to go to, say, a professional level and you need to dive into the, you know, get really deep into the ATS to have candidates figure out which job they want to apply to uh, and tie in deeply, that technology costs, you know, it, it raises the bar on the cost and the maintenance. Uh, as everyone knows, HR tech integrations um, are costly uh, and they take a long time to implement. Uh, but if you are doing hourly um, and it's high volume, where I would almost say like no resume candidates, um, uh, those types of implementations are relatively quick. Like, I mean, we literally can get clients up in hours um, in that case. And but usually we say two, three, you know, two, three days mm -hmm. um, to get them set up. So. The it again, it depends the professional side where you absolutely can use chatbots for those sides. It's just we're seeing the most traction and the biggest benefit to the clients is in the hourly because those are transactional um, uh, fields rather than uh, more culture fit mm -hmm. where we really need, I mean, that you want your technology really dialed in. So it's going to be more expensive and they, they, they work for both use cases, but um, the hourly one has the biggest demand at this point from clients. Got it. So most companies today, as you know, Jonathan, are very cognizant of DEI. Is this something that chatbots and SMS technology reflect in the added focus on DEI? I think we're going to be probably the at least from our side, we're going to be one of the only companies that are not going to have marketing and press releases coming out about DNI. Uh, and the reason why is we're not, um, especially when we use say, a, a text to apply solution, we're really getting con candidate contact information and then pushing them right to a scheduling uh, if they're qualified. So most of our clients, they're not doing like culture fit. Uh, we're not segmenting people out. Um, but and we're not really a recruitment marketing where we're trying to um, go out, um, you know, and, and uh, reach to certain markets. We're really the tool that really is almost like the applicant tracking system. Applicant tracking systems in and of itself can have sourcing DI uh, solutions, but we're mm -hmm. really just the met method to communicate. It's almost like we're a workforce messaging automation platform. So, we can automate messages back and forth, but uh, we don't really get involved with, you know, who's coming in and then who's being responded to. Everyone's treated the same. They just ask the same questions, yes, no. And, you know, we can do multilingual type things as well. But so we're not really that much of a DNI focused company at this point. One thing I wanted you to talk about when we did our prep call, you told me that you had become an Uber driver. So you could reverse engineer the process that they use in hiring. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I found that really fascinating. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because I haven't really told people this, but it's actually how I founded Go Hire was in 2016, um, when I was building Good Hire, a small business background screening company, I was also building all of the uh, integrations. And uh, we had Uber 
uh, we were running some campaigns with Uber um, for their background screening of drivers. And I saw the volume of candidates going through and I'm like, what's going on? So I reached out, you know, to some of the stalwarts in the industry, Jerry Crispin and whatnot, and said, has, has anyone ever seen this number of candidates? And uh, most people don't know this, uh, which you know, it, it, it's a great topic in and of itself. I can speak to it about for an hour, but Uber hired 600,000 drivers in six months in just the U.S. So that was like, if you just think about it, like you were going, if you went to Sherm, I think Sherm was in Florida that year in Orlando. Um, and I would like show up and I was like, Uber's here. And then I'd go to HR Tech in Vegas, Uber's here. And they just, it just kept popping up everywhere, right? So that's what they, 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 but no one thought about, okay, how do they recruit these drivers? And that, that's what I think about. So um, I, I was astonished and I said, well, okay, I got to figure out, no one knew how they were doing this. So I signed up as an Uber driver, went through the process and I did the same thing with Lyft. Um, but it's a real eye-opening because if anyone is competing with these shift gig economies. In, in fact, I'd almost go out to say, I, I, I've, I've, even if you're VP of talent uh, at, a, at Marriott, I think you need to apply as an Uber driver because you need to see how, you know, Uber's been doing this stuff for six or eight years now, and it's a completely different apply process. So what it is, is they only ask four pieces of information in a web form. They want your first name, your last name, your email address and phone number. Then uh, as soon as you apply, uh, you get uh, a text message back. And so I get a message like, hi, hey, John, great. We've got your information. Um, the next step is I need you to click this link and take a picture of your driver's license and upload it. Well, why do they need that? Well, you're not going to be an Uber driver if you don't have a driver's license, right? <laughs> so they they start at the absolute basic, absolute mandatory. Um, if you don't pass this step, don't go pass go. Um, so which is totally different than the applicant tracking system for, for professionals that we've built, which has been spend 40 minutes, fill out this form. We're going to ask you for your birth certificate. For what? Like none of that stuff's relevant, completely irrelevant in the first form, right? right. So um uh, they sped that process up and then they would, and then I'd get another text message a, after I uh, entered my resume. It would say, okay, John, we've got your information. The next step is I need you to click this link and give me a authorization for background check. Okay. So step by step, I take a step, I get a text. I take a step, I get a step text. And so what that does is instead of a long form, you need to do everything and 20 required fields and upload a resume and you know, um, and put all your references down and who on a mobile phone has number one, all their references and their resume on their, on their phone for, you know, for sakes. Um, and they've just made it text by text by text. And so um, why that's important is if you just think about that candidate, the process that like timeline is, um, Many of our clients have like a seven day, we'll call them a um, applicant to conversion or, you know, to offer letter that can take seven days. Candidate fills out the form. Then we respond back, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of human interaction involved in there. We've been able to break that down from a seven day time to, um, you know, from the apply initial apply to the offer in less than 24 hours or 48 hours for clients because we just move candidates, just like Uber did, move them through from apply to pre-screen uh, or interview all through text messaging and just automate the processes. That makes a lot of sense. It really does. Yeah, it's just phenomenal. I'm DoorDash, anyone else who comes up and if you see any of these companies, um, you know, the inquisitive directors and recruiters, I'd say sign up. You don't have to go drive. Just sign up and and take a look. Like I had no intention of driving, believe it or not, but I'll tell you another really funny story uh, to give you kind of a little mindset of how my brain works. So I live, I live uh, close by uh, San Francisco on the peninsula here in California. And 
Uber's main headquarters is in downtown San Francisco. So I would drive to downtown, turn on the Uber app, wait for product managers and technical people to show up, you know, after five o'clock uh-huh. um, because they would all get free, you know, Uber rides. So I would get all their employees to, you know, I'd drive their employees around, ask them a bunch of questions. They had no idea that I had just asked like five other employee employees a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> and then I turned the app off. I, I mean, once I dropped them off, I'd go to the headquarters again. And, you know, by eight o'clock, nine o'clock, all the uh, programmers are leaving. And then I drive them home, ask them questions. But it was, it was just amazing how much inside information you get into the whole processes doing something like that. Wow, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just how my brain works. Like I want to, I, I want the details. Yeah, you know that sounds like a David Perry thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was actually kind of funny. Like one, I, one of my funnest things about that thing was. Uh, I picked uh, an Uber, and this is how I kind of figured it out, was I picked up a uh, Uber project manager who had just come back from uh, China when Uber was spending, you know, <laughs> maybe up to billions, but millions and millions of dollars trying to break into the Chinese market. And he was saying, oh, man, it's just a slugfest. And it was like two weeks later, they entirely pulled out of uh, China. Yeah, right. One other thing you talked about in our prep call, you referred to as a concept called bring back the dead. Can you share this with our audience? Yeah. So this is actually interesting. So, you know, we have lots of candidates in our applicant tracking systems. We have lots of, this is another part of this dead cycle. We've got a lot of candidates that have worked for us before. Let's just call them alumni. And, um, especially if you're, if acquisition is a problem or you've got a uh, high turnover, a lot of people, especially because of COVID, you know, had to leave because of to take care of somebody or they, you know, in this time of the great resignation, they may have left for, you know, a dollar more and then you changed your um, uh, pay structure and they may want to come back too. Um, but one of the, you know, we have this asset pool of candidates that, we just need to be able to reach out to in a mass way. So with text messaging, you can get a 30, you know, plus, you know, usually 15 to 30% response rate of these, you know, call them, let's call them the dead candidates mm-hmm. uh, or even alumni who worked for you two years ago. But, you know, if we tried to reach them all like we had in the past, like, you know, the typical process is candidate applies, make a phone call, send them an email. If they don't respond, send them a phone call and email two days later. Um, but we know that phone and email is number one, they're not working like they used to. Uh, and then we also know if, and I always ask clients this on the phone, which almost sells themselves on the concept of why texting works is, you know, how many do you get robocalls? And they're like, absolutely. And then I say, well, do you realize your candidates don't pick up the phone either because they don't know your phone number? So the, the two major ways we've recruited over the last 25 years has been send the candidate an email, make a phone call. If they don't respond, send them an email, make a phone call. But those tools don't work as well as they used to, especially for the non-desk worker. So the process we've seen that is changing this is when we've got these candidates that are sitting in an applicant tracking system, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a, you know, several thousand, but we can send a bulk broadcast or a broadcast message to these candidates. And it's really simple to do only takes a couple minutes, but um, we can get 15 to 30% response rate. So say we have a hundred candidates that worked for us in the past. So let's just say we're an amusement park and we're doing summer hiring. We can, send a message to a quick text message to those hundred candidates. And in that message, we can say, uh, hi, first name. So we make it personalized. And this is kind of the best practice for text. Um, So we say, hi, first name. This is recruiter at company X. Um, I know you've worked with us in the past. Uh, Are you interested and available about talking about coming back to work with us? And then the computer adds in, uh, reply Y for yes or N for no. And if they reply yes, the recruiter's done at that point. All they have to do is send the text message because then the computer picks up the conversation. We call this an automated conversation. 
the computer can pick up the conversation and then respond back to the candidate and say, um, would you like to schedule a time with the recruiter? And if they say yes, then we'll go to the recruiter's calendar uh, and then uh, we'll go back and say, uh, uh, okay, here's a couple of times that might work for you. If these things work, then just choose a time. Otherwise you can get more or you can reschedule. And then we send, you know, we're essentially putting the candidates onto the recruiter's calendar. Wow. That must save so much time. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Jonathan, is there anything we've missed when it comes to discussing the advantages of using this type of technology that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I think it's all about just how you can speed up the process um, about looking for something that is can help with engagement or that kind of reach out. Mm-hmm. That's where texting, and it's not just about you know our company. There's lots of texting companies out there, but it's about two things is the automation on top of texting in and of itself. So when I said like this last part about the, the calendar integration, sure, you could text candidates and have them call you back. But if you send 100 candidates, that's 30 people about to call you. That may not work for your workflow. Meanwhile, you can just send them to your calendar and have the computer actually schedule the candidates. So that's where I think you're going to see the wins overall is that kind of automation piece. And that stuff's relatively new. Um, we just announced these kind of automation um, conversations in the last you know, couple of months. That's cool. So how can our viewers and podcast listeners connect with you, Jonathan? My email is jd at gohire.com. Happy to respond to anyone. And our website is gohire.com. And then I'm on LinkedIn as well. And I've been doing this stuff, you know, Peter, you know, for 26 years. So I'm a wealth of information on recruiting processes and even tips and tricks on how to make this stuff work. Thank you for tuning into the Total Picture Podcast. If you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button. It'll be greatly appreciated. This is Peter Clayton. See you soon.